everyone. Welcome to the show. My guest today is Jake Taylor. Jake is the CEO and portfolio manager at Farnham Street, and he's also the author of The Rebel Allocator, which I believe is the only example of investment fiction ever created as far as I'm aware. Are you aware of anything else existing? Uh <clears throat> I don't know about investments, but um, if there's anything else in that category, but there's definitely other okay. fiction business that have hap- come out. Uh, you have The Goal by Eli Goldratt, which was Toyota's lean manufacturing mm-hmm. explained through a story. Um, <clears throat> you have, uh, I think, uh, Patrick uh, Lich- Luc- what's his name? Lucioni, something like that. I'm, I'm mispronouncing it, I'm sure, but uh, he's he's got several books that are that are fiction that are kind of business and culture related. So there's, it's out there, but yeah, well, I don't know about well, it. funny. I was thinking books. about uh, it and you and I had actually discussed it after you'd finished writing one of your drafts and before you'd published it, before it had gotten published. And, um, as I recall, you and I had a couple discussions and I was trying to talk you out of making it exactly what you made it. I, 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 I was totally, and, and then when the book came out and I read it, I was like, oh, actually what he is doing is totally right. And my advice sucked. But I, but I was like, oh, maybe it should be a referendum on capitalism and, um, or, you know, entrepreneurship and all this stuff. And you're like, no, I want it to be literally about value investing and investing. And, and that's exactly what you did. And it's, and so it's become a huge hit. You have something like 350 reviews on Amazon, which is amazing. Yeah, it's uh, definitely has been a sold better than I ever would have expected. Uh, Cause I, there was plenty of self doubt that went into the, the front end of that uh, because of the, like you said, not a lot of precedent for uh, using fiction to explain capital allocation. And, uh, but, but yeah, it's, uh, it was, pleasantly received and um hopefully ideally it it helps someone earlier in the investment journey and earlier in the uh you know business decision making um journey like find their feet a little bit and get a little bit more comfortable with the lay of the land and the tools available to them as they're making capital allocation decisions within a business and uh if that was the mark that it that it made to like especially help younger people uh, that would be really you know, I'm satisfying. Curious, writing a book is, you know, I, I, I've written um, four novels now, and it, it is a lot of work. It's an intense thing. It's, and I, 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 I mean, it does. Is it drives the, you I'm to want to kill that yourself. The right word? <laughs> it, it's, I mean, there. It, it's like, I, for me, I think writing a rough draft is like it's like going out drinking and blacking out, and then once you're done with the rough draft, it's like you wake up and you come to, and you're like, what the what the hell did I do? And, and sometimes, and sometimes it's not too bad. It's you're like, <laughs> okay, cool. Happened? Like th- that's not too bad. And other times you're like, wow, this is, this is shit. But, but I'm curious, you know, where did you, <laughs> you know, to write something, you know, value investing is a very esoteric part of the world. Really, you know, something like 5% of assets are probably managed by true value investors. And so, and here you are, yeah. What's that? Yeah, and, tr- and, 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 and they, they're dead. <laughs> They've gone through a lost decade, basically, so there's even fewer. Um, but then here you are writing something that's fiction and is this and is really, you know, there's a lot of passion behind that. You know, wh- where did you kind of get the drive to do this thing every day for, you know, you're working on it for a year or two, something like that? Oh, okay. it was like at least three years. Um because, I mean, as you remember, like, I had gone pretty far in a direction of a nonfiction version. Um, and we talked about that, you and I, um, I think a few times. And had a book deal, even, like, with a real publisher. But um, just when I looked at what that book was going to turn into, it just seemed, like, so boring and so, uh, mm-hmm. like, what had already been done. Uh, that I was like, okay, I have to do something different and it has to be a story. Otherwise, you know, that's people only remember stories. And so that's like, I need to put that into a format. And so that was when I lost my mind for about three years and, and had to go down this, it almost was like its own hero's journey, uh, that you had to experience with all the, you know, dark, 
places and then emerging on the other end a, a changed you know person uh but i mean uh, honestly though the forcing function of having to write a book about this topic was a such a great learning um forcing function uh can't come up with a better word than that uh, to just really have to think through it at very an atomistic level at you know and the way that you know, making it in a book where mm-hmm. it's mostly narrative uh, and like conversations between two people that are the way that you tease out the details um, actually like was a good like it was a very uh, Socratic method, actually, like self Socratic, like having the the the, you know, young uh, Pedawan, you know, learner have to ask the question and then like he's asking very simple innocent questions and then when you actually try to sit down and give a good answer from the yoda it's like shit maybe like i don't understand this as well as i thought like i, I can't get it down to a level that is explainable uh which then forces you to refine well, that's and really the thing, work right? on it, you can so. only write something if you believe it to be true otherwise it just doesn't work the whole thing falls apart and you really have to think it yeah i, I agree with that 100 percent. like i uh I I feel like it's something that more like you have to dislodge from your yeah. guts and it's not, you know, this like happy process. It's like I have to get oh, this totally. demon off my back. Totally. Every book I've ever done, I wrote it. There, there's some saying readers read to remember and writers write to forget. And, and every book I've ever done, I just wanted mm. to be free of it. That's really powerful. I think there's a lot of truth to that. I, I, uh, I feel like now uh, if I was to go back and have to – reread the book um i don't have a lot of interest in doing that and like the analogy that i've made before is that it's like if you spent you know three years on a desert island with with a loved one like you still love them you still you know like you you cherish the relationship but when you get back to the mainland you don't really want to spend (laughs) that much time with them anymore right (laughs) kind of want to take a break like you know i'm you know you're working on this thing every day you know what was sort of the thought that got you to your desk. I mean, were you writing in the morning or at night? When did you like to write? I had to treat it like a job. Like I had to have a, you know, you show up at, at 8 a.m. and you're going to sit there until at least 10 a.m. And, it, you know, the first hour is that, that I think, that white shoes problem they've called it before where – you like you're polishing your shoes. You're doing everything except writing a book. Like everything sounds important. Like oh, I need to do this uh, to just get away from the pain of getting the flow going again. Uh, and you know, I tried to use Hemingway's trick about leaving mid sentence from the day before, uh, so that you had some thread to mm-hmm. pick up and then keep going. But you know that that works for a little bit. Uh, but you know, a lot of times you, it felt more like a, uh, the flow is more of that of like an 85 year old man with, oh, with yeah. prostate I, cancer. I, yeah. you know? It's just so inter, intermittent. Uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, I had to treat it like a job and sit down and force myself. And, um, you know, I, I had like little environmental cues that I would try to do like music, um, like put the same song on repeat and have that just playing over and over again while I was, Like, that's when I got into writing mode. And then eventually, like, you find this flow state and, like, stuff just comes out. And then, you know, you get – you keep going and, like, you lose all track of time. And and then, like, you sort of get to a spot and you're like, okay, like, I think I'm kind of, like, all the toothpaste paste is Mm -hmm. out of the tube for today. Uh, I'm going to just leave it and I'll come back tomorrow and fight again. Did you set sort of a a word count that you wanted to hit each day or or you just kind of – No – I didn't really do that. Like I, I bro- you know, because I, I had it storyboarded out actually, like on a physical, um, you know, like a, uh, a, uh, cork board, like a big, you know, cork board with little like three by five index cards with different scenes. Like I, I, I made it into like a screenplay basically. in in as far as the way it was set up so that it flowed like a, and, and I got that from actually reading books about writing screenplays so that I could, tease out this story and have it like flow in a narrative and, and like hit the high and low points of that you need to hit mm-hmm. to have that emotional journey. Um, so it, it ended up being, I, I had it on this, these index cards, different scenes. And so I would just be trying to like work on one scene, which is, you know, basically like one chapter at a time. Um, and that, that helped me to make it a, feel a little mm-hmm. bit more like bite-sized as opposed to just like, okay, sit down right. and tell this whole story. Right. 
Oh, that's interesting. So I did you find that you really had to gut it out a lot as opposed to like you're just sort of showed up and the inspiration came and you were just channeling something? Oh, this this idea of a muse is uh, I couldn't <laughs> think of that. It's more stupid. I mean, it's it's I, I did not have any kind of muse. It was uh, it was more like you just have to gut this out every single day. And like it's a game of like you're just taking a few inches of territory every day in this war and uh, sometimes feeling like you're giving it back the next day. But no, it wasn't, you, it was a grind. Yeah, it out I mean, that, that's my experience. experience too, where it's almost like the inspiration never comes first. It only pops up while you're, you've got your kind of shoulder to the, to the, you know, to the wheel. And it's like only then it's like, it's like just this yeah, little sure. side effect, this temporary little blip. And then it's, and then it's gone and you're back to just kind of gutting it out. And I, I think there's a little bit of that same experience of uh, like running a marathon where they say that you're about halfway done when you're at mile mm-hmm. 20 of 26. Uh, and that is then the editing oh, that, process oh, after. So like, you, let's say you get to some kind of first draft and like, oh, I've run 20 miles at this point. Well, yeah, like maybe, but you're really more like the feeling of halfway done at that point uh, just because the at least for me, I felt like the editing and just going over the material over and over and over and again, and just trying to keep polishing got to be, uh, you know, quite cumbersome. And it was like grinding out those last, you know, six miles that felt like the second yeah, half that's interesting. of the marathon. That is true. The, the editing at the end is hell. It, it, it's absolute hell. You just <laughs> stop caring. It's yeah, it's really hard to keep like you said, keep that wheel to the... But, but the terrible thing is, is with the, the editing, it's sort of like, I, I have this fear when I finish a book that, you know, I finished a rough draft and I haven't done much editing and that something's going to happen where I die. And I've actually written a great book, but it just hasn't been revised. So my family, you know, pulls it out and is sort of like, oh, well, maybe we can get... Some... Yeah, and they're like, this and is like, a this piece is of crap. shit. Like, he lost his mind at the end or something. But the reality is it's great. Yeah. It just hasn't been edited. That That is one of my biggest fears. I start freaking out, and then I start editing. Yeah, and definitely good writing is yeah. 100% rewriting. I mean, you ha- like I, I think there's not a sentence in there that wasn't rewritten probably three or four times to clean up the language, to minimize the words, to change the uh, – <clears throat> to like really try to capture the tone in a minimum number of words. Cause the English language is very rich and there is almost always a word that would like get rid of four other words within the mm-hmm. sentence, if you can find it. Um, and so that's like part of the, part of the grind is just trying to get it down to a clean as you can um, writing, which is not easy. And, and oftentimes what's hard is that it's, it's uh, I think Stephen King said that like good writing was like, or second draft is first draft minus 10%. Like you have to cut at least 10% of off your first yeah. draft to get to the second draft. Um, and so, you know, that process of, you know, when you feel like, well, what would I cut out of here? Like all this is important. It's like, no, you have to, you got to be ruthless. It's hard. Kill your darlings. Oh, by the way, I love how, so the, the protagonist, <laughs> yeah. the hero, um, he starts off in the book kind of, you know, a little bit of a socialist, is he a, is he maybe a little Marxist too, or, sure. or is that ex, that excessive? He's probably not. Uh, okay, probably hasn't thought about it. Okay, all right, but let, let's call him. A, let's call him a socialist. <laughs> and and it, I, but I love how you made the parents hippies. I, I love I love that. I was laughing every so, time a lot they, of this... they came up because because no one ever discusses that, right? The hippies in movies are always shown as the people who really care and and they're the ones whose heart are in the right place, and everyone else is a son of a bitch. But but in your book, like you showed the kind of irresponsible hippie, which you know I lived in Los Angeles for ten years. We used to come across people like that all the time, and some of them were great. But the, <laughs> like there is this kind of dipshit hippie person, yeah. you know, type out there. So, I mean, that was a, uh, you know, a literary effect, like a dr- used for dramatic effect of to, to, to have the, the main character go through the most change, which is what is required mm-hmm. of a good hero's journey. I wanted to pull the bow back as far as I could in one direction so that he had farther to travel to get to where he ended up. So that's how he started. So socialist with the parents also. Um, so it wasn't. 
maybe it wasn't quite a hundred percent, you know, just pure social commentary as much as it was a literary effect to to give right. that here. Well, I thought it was art. great though, and I and and at the end, I loved that the, how the dad, you know, borrowed some money from his son or something like that. And the, you know, and I think before that, at some point, there was a lecture about something in the world that was wrong, and then and then, you know, nicked his kid for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I think there's uh, sometimes the if you play out that string far enough, uh, that that probably is yeah. the conclusion. I'm you curious, end up did at, you right? ever have, you know, Mister X in it is. Um, you know, someone who's very similar in a lot of ways to, to Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett and, and you know, a few others as well. But mm-hmm. I'm, I'm curious, did you ever have a mentor when you were starting out in investing? I did. Yeah, I was very fortunate. Um, and it was very happenstance, actually. So, you know, my background working, uh, running the energy grid for California and uh, my boss there and was uh actually on a very very fast track to like basically become ceo but when he when he i first met him i was 23 uh and i was fresh out of college he's 10 years older than me and he took me under his wing and you know helped me within the company to like make progress and he was rapidly ascending inside the company you know going through manager to director to vp um and and then one day he announced he was leaving and everyone was like shocked, but he had been a huge Buffett fan for more than 10 years at that point, And he left to start his own fund, uh, hmm. you know, a Buffett partnership. And so that I asked if I could intern at his, at his, uh, fund. And it was that, which was basically just him and I, uh, o- over at his house. Uh, and for, which is every know, fund more than a year, that, that's every this fund. internship. It, it's every fun, right? Yeah, unless you're coming right, right sorry, out of Goldman or something, but but yeah. So more than a year, it was going over to his house uh, and like basically him giving me a condensed version of ten years worth of his studying um, and getting me kind of caught up on what it means to be a good investor. Uh, and you know, we went all over the place in our conversations and in business and everywhere, and and then. Uh, <clears throat> to the point where I was like, shit, I'm, I'm in grad school actively mm-hmm. at that point and also working. And I'm like, I'm learning so much more when I'm over at, at Lonnie's house than I am in school. And I'm reading Buffett and I'm like, Buffett's saying the exact opposite of what all these teachers are saying. Like, what is, this is madness. Uh, so I was like, I, you know, being a little mischievous, I thought, I wonder if I could just get credit for doing this internship and then not have to like take one of these other bozo classes. And uh, I shouldn't say that. There were a lot of good classes and great teachers, but I, not not what I was interested in as much as the as value investing. Um, so I, I put together an internship, basically like you know, uh, independent study, quote unquote. And I ended up talking some of my friends into doing it with me. And so Lonnie and I basically taught a class very accidentally at UC Davis, uh, based on the, what we'd been working on for the last year together. Uh, and, and then, uh, we kept getting like the students liked it so much. Like they heard about it, like after I graduated and they asked us to come back for like the next three summers, like we taught that same class because like the popular swell within was like, Oh, these guys should do this class again. Will you come do it? Uh, so it was a very accidental backdoor kind of professorship that went through that was also a great forcing function to learn. So the short answer is yes, I, I was very incredibly fortunate to get someone who cared about my development. And uh, and so Lonnie and I then started Farnham Street together um, after that and rolled his fund into Farnham Street eventually. And now like he's still one of my best friends and uh, just well, still I've met Lonnie a bunch of times. Time. So he was the guy who was your boss. Yeah. He, he's 10 years he's older guy. than you are. Yep. God, he, he looks incredible. Yeah. But I, when fit. I met him, he was yeah. doing the thing where, <laughs> you know, he, uh, he was doing intermittent fasting, which I, I've just I've just never eaten breakfast my whole life. Yeah. So I guess I do it, too. But he was also doing it with water where he was restricting. He was restricting time, restricting oh, yeah. his water intake. It, it... So if you like uh, I've been witnessing this now for, uh, you know, almost 20 years and 
watching his – like, if you want to know what's coming next, like, if you want to know what Peter Atia and Joe Rogan and all these other guys are going to be into in, like, two years, just ask Lonnie what he's doing today. Like, he is – He's way out on the the edge. Like it's so it's so much fun to have him as a friend because of, uh, just oh, for that crazy. one reason alone. I, I can't believe he's ten years older than you are. He's a great guy. I've met him a bunch of times. The world is kind of a poorer place because he is so private. Like if he was out, you know, on Twitter or doing, you know, public stuff where everyone kind of got to follow along with him, like it would be actually a lot more fun but he's a very private person like he'd probably be annoyed that i've even <laughs> said his real name on this but <laughs> you know, we'll keep curious, his last I'm name ask about, you about something i i feel like for a lot of people in who are value investors and, and i think this is distinct from most other professional investors but for value investors there is something about investing that goes way beyond money and in fact, most of the value investors I know, mm. I, I, w- I, would, I wouldn't characterize them as, as oddly that motivated by money. You know, they certainly care about it and they're, they're looking to get wealthy and all that. But they're oddly, they oddly kind of lack that acquisitive sense that a lot of people, a lot of executives and ambitious people have. And, and for them, you know, and you really get it when you listen to Munger and, and Buffett speak. You know, they don't sound like anyone else in the investment industry. There's a... There's kind of this more morality there. And, you know, I think, you know, and I'm curious, you know, does is that aspect of it, did that play a role in, in writing the book? Because, I, you know, I've known you for, for years now, and I, I don't know, you, you strike me as someone who very much embodies what I'm talking about. Uh, well, I'd like to flatter myself to think that that were the case. Uh, I aspire towards that for sure. Um, you know, I... I don't know what it is about. I, I think you. I think you hit it on the head that it's probably Graham before Buffett, and then Buffett as the you know the the wide distribution mm-hmm. version of it. But both of those guys, especially, are were teachers at heart. Like Graham, literally teaching at Columbia and having multiple interests outside of just investing, um, and Buffett being very hyper focused on investing, but. Always like when they've asked him before, like, what do you want to be remembered as? Like, what do you want your legacy to be? And he says teacher. And I think this like kind of giving back and teaching and sharing with others uh, mentality has has kind of cast the die a little bit for the value investing community in general as wanting to be um, pro social in that way with other value investors and not um, like really treating it like as a a Mm -hmm. non zero sum game. Um, And I think maybe that's the difference is that I I think if you're more Wall Street sort of like by origin um, and and if you're like attracted to Wall Street, that's a it's kind of a zero sum thinking to it. Like you're going to take something from someone else. You're a shark who's going to be eating, you know, the whales like it's it's a it's a even the word choices lead into this kind of mindset of wanting to dominate others versus, you know, Buffett and Munger who like Buffett was on Wall Street. In when he was working at Graham Newman, but he left, and I think that was for a good reason. Is what like that wasn't his personality, and he was more interested in non-zero sum games with people, um, and and especially as that got to further and further into buying private businesses, like that was even more so a non-zero sum game. And and I think that the amount of fun that they had buying and the people that they got to meet uh, because of that activity, like th- I think that their like their lives were much richer than just purely if he had if he had only been running Buffett Partnership Limited uh, for that whole time. He, you could make the argument he might actually have more money if that was the case because he would have been taking like a, you know, a, a 25% rip on profits <laughs> above 6%. Uh, as opposed to when he took over at Berkshire and now he's got a salary of 100000 a year and that was it. And, and he just owned, you know, a third or maybe like 40% of the company or something um, at that point. So... Yeah, I think you're right. Like, I think it's because of the founding fathers and the ethos of this that that has the move, like, has that pro social feeling to it. But um, I'm I'm hopeful that whoever takes over is sort of the next generation of of representing this uh, cult or <laughs> you know this this group of people who have similar values and similar ambitions and similar. Um, ways of going about their their business um i hope that they continue with that same kind of teaching mindset and 
at yeah. zero, not it, zero. It, it's interesting thinking. after doing, you know, I, I started in investing in value investing. I, you know, my dad was a value investor. I think his dad was into value investing too. And it's, it's funny how, when you start there, how repulsive the rest of the terminology and the mindset is in investing. Like I'll, I'll read stuff that people write on value investors club, which is nominally for value investors. And it's like, Oh, this stock's going to go parabolic. And it's like this hyper emotional, just shallow language. It's just, I don't know. I feel like a piece of shit even, you know, reading it, it but it's terrible. It's just a, <laughs> it's just a, if that were what it took to make money, I'd rather do something else. I, I agree, and I've, I've had my own, uh, call it a little bit of existential crises sometimes around, like, if you were only, you know, trading securities and basically pushing paper, like, what what good does that really do in the grand scheme of, you know, a bunch of trouser-wearing apes floating around on a rock in the middle of nowhere? Um, you know, like, that's... That's kind of a shallow existence, really, if that's all the only thing that you do and that's the only thing you're thinking about. Um, whereas, you know, and, and again, this may be a little bit of motivated reasoning on my own part, but like I'd like to think that the companies that I buy are doing good things for for their customers, for the owners, for the communities that they do business in, for their suppliers. Like they're in this ecosystem and they're a productive cog within this whole machine. And, uh, you know, I think that they, they kind of keep the society that we all enjoy and like keep human suffering at bay, uh, you know, through material wanting, uh, they, you know, they help keep this, this, this clock turning. And, and I'd like to think that that is like a force for good when it comes to, to humans and how they interact. And, um, you know, I mean, that's again, you know, if it's only in a public investing context, the argument's a little thinner than because my ownership is being, you know, I'm purchasing from someone else who's selling, and typically they're selling for reasons that they're either scared or they're a forced seller or something. But, um, you know, that doesn't feel great always. Uh, but the businesses themselves, like I try to think that like I'm I'm a good owner of them, and I try to like think as an owner and what would be good for the entire ecosystem. And that that uh, you know, as as Adam Smith even had talked about, like everyone doing what's sort of good for themselves happens to coalesce into this thing that we call capitalism that, that actually creates a greater good on whole. Um, and just through, I don't know, one of the sheer kind of chances and of luck of the universe that that's yeah, the way I that mean, it for, works for out. For me, it, it goes back to entropy where it's, you know, what wealth almost doesn't want to exist or, or the world doesn't want wealth to exist. And everything we have is from wealth. You know, the, the houses we're sitting in are capital. You know, the businesses we have are capital. All, all our technology is capital. And it's like the world just wants to take that that state of organization and level it down to a state of chaos through in, in some manner, whether it's fast or slow. And there's, I, I, I guess I feel like my yes. own personal theory is that value investors, it's a lot easier to save and conserve than it is to create, right? And, in, and if, with investing, you're not really creating, but you are being a really good steward of what exists for the people coming after you. And, and the, what I, what gets me really excited when I'm investing is the thought that, you know, it would make my own life better, but then it it's something for my kids too, where, you know, having those things, it's like, you know, if you don't, it, it's like, you know, being, what's so scary about being poor is there's literally no buffer between you and the world. It's, you're always yeah. at the subsistence level and you don't get to think about, you know, you don't get to think deep thoughts and, and your time isn't your own. You know, I think, yeah, you know, in the third world, people spend more of their time hauling water than any other activity. You know, stuff like that, where it's backbreaking labor. But I think there's something about it where I, I feel like, particularly with value investors, it's not about getting rich and acquiring status. It's sort of like I just want to be responsible with things, and it bleeds over into everything. I remember when I was in Los Angeles, I bought a used Audi. Okay, it was three years old. Uh huh. And I was hanging out with a bunch of value investors, and one of the guys goes, oh, Scott, you got a really nice car. And I was like, whoa, no, I, I got it used. Like, it, it's three years used, like, you know, <laughs> just so you guys know. you know. But it's it's funny. That's not, like, a, an okay thing in the value world. Can, can I do you one better yeah. on that, one, that car story? I, uh... <laughs> so 
my wife wanted a Prius, and I was like, okay. And I, I was looking around on Craigslist, and you could get – they were going for, let's call, like, a you know, couple-year-old Prius. They were going for, let's say, twenty to 24000 depending on how it was kitted out. And I noticed that you could get a salvage title one for half that, basically. And so – I found this one and I took it into the mechanic, had him look at it. And the, the difference was, is you can't get financing for a salvage title vehicle. Mm -hmm. So you have to pay cash. So there's this inherent disconnect in what the market will yield for, because of the amount of buyers available who can just pay cash for a car. Uh, so I ended up paying $12,000 for this salvage title Prius. Never gave me a lick of trouble for, we bought it in 2008. I drove it until – well, uh, she drove it for a while, and then she wanted a minivan, so I bought her that. And then it was like, okay, do I keep my truck or do I keep this Prius? Like, the Prius gets really good mileage. All right, <laughs> shit. Well, I'll keep the Prius. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah. That's a, that's, a real, that's a real <laughs> tough decision right there. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a real adult uh, maneuver. But uh, I drove it until I got sideswiped. Um, and I ended up getting still – I got $4,000 in, like, salvage – or in, like, insurance payment for it. And so my my all-in cost of driving this thing for, like, a decade came down to, like, four cents a mile. That's – Literally. That's crazy. I, I calculated it. That's crazy. What is salvage title? What is Yeah. That? So if a car has been in an accident and it's been totaled – so, like, the, the insurance company has deemed that it's cheaper to just total the car as opposed to fix it. And then and then let you drive it. They'll instead give you a check, and they'll take the car, and then they'll they'll sell it at auction typically, and then people will go buy it and fix it back up, and then sell it. But the the vehicle has been has been compromised and is okay. now called salvage title. Okay. So, but with cars though now, like they get they get totaled so easily, and it's so expensive to fix them that you know this car had been rear ended, and but and that totaled it, but. I mean, there was nothing wrong with it, really, once the cosmetic stuff was fixed. So did you – now, did driving the Prius only versus the truck, did you feel different in, in that car? I noticed, like, when I drive a, a, a sensible car, yeah, I suddenly turn sure. into a more, like, sensible, moderate guy. <laughs> uh, it wasn't that effect. Was I was actually – I used it in a stoic way as a, like, a humility enforcer. Like, this was how <laughs> I humbled myself. Because when you pull up – in you know next to a, a convertible with you know three young attractive women in it and you're sitting in this prius uh like you know that puts your ego in check a fair amount and i i like that like i i enjoyed that little bit of uh sacrifice uh that made me feel like okay you yeah, think you're hot shit but here you are in this you car can't this, leer at them. you can't know, <laughs> you can't leer savage at them. title prius no nope there's there's no feeling like you're a badass in that situation. So that's that's like your how you I, I used to actually call it like the humble. I, I, we mobile. have three kids, my wife and I, and at one point people were like, You guys need to get a minivan and, and I would ask people who who have the minivan, I'd be like, Okay, how long ago did you get the minivan? And they'd be like, Oh, you know, two years ago and I'd be like, Be honest with me, did you start having less sex after you got the minivan? Because there there's just <laughs> something about it. You know, I'm not sure any woman wants is interested in a guy who's driving around the minivan. And I, you know, when I see a woman driving driving around a minivan, I feel nothing. <laughs> uh, well, all right. I think there is some truth to that, but I think there's also like we got some real causation <laughs> correlation issues to unpack there with like timing of life. Young children is a is a killer of oh you know romanticism. Uh, so there's a lot to unpack there. Like we've got. The covariance here is a real uh, issue. So in writing your book, yeah. you uh, – so you wrote this book. Uh, it got published. And then something happened where Charlie Munger got word of it somehow. W what's the story there? Yeah. I mean I wish that it was like, oh, uh, you know, Warren sent it to him yeah. and was uh, – <laughs> yeah, you got to read this, Charlie. You're going to love it. Yeah. Um, but the the truth is is that you know I sent a copy to to Charlie and with a nice note that just said like you know you're you were a huge part of the inspiration for wanting to write this and you know as hopefully maybe it's something interesting for you but you know I wouldn't expect you to read it um, <clears throat> and and that was what then 
I you know I probably sent that in December I think of twenty okay nineteen. Uh, the book came out like fall of twenty nineteen, and then January of twenty twenty, he called. Uh, he found like my office phone number and what was that? What was and, that like? Uh, how, how did he get through? Got through. He actually talked to my assistant first, and then uh, I wasn't. I was actually not in the office at that moment when he called. Uh, and she called me and said, you're not going to believe this, but Charlie Munger called. He wants you to call him back. And I'm kind of like, all right, <laughs> somebody's messing with me. Like, it's like, did Toby, like, you know, do something to, he, you know, he knows how much this would mean to me. Is he just, you know, messing with me? But I, I knew she wasn't actually messing with me. But uh, so I, he, she gave me the, you know, it's a 310 area code. I'm like, oh, that's LA. Right. Like, this could actually be him, you know? Uh <laughs> So I call and like first ring, a, a woman answers like Munger residence, and and then I say, hey, uh, Charlie called, you know, a half hour ago. I was, you know, I'm tr- trying to call him back. Oh yeah, hold on a second. And like two seconds later, he's on the phone, and it's just like when you're at Berkshire and you're hearing him talk, and uh, you know, I and then for the next you know 35 minutes, I proceeded to just try to not say anything stupid that made him want to hang up that was that was my I, only I have to ask so I love I love Munger I'm a huge fan he's he's made material changes to my life and my my career but there is a part of him that reminds me of like a gentleman in the 18th century who carries you know a large staff to beat orphans and the needy off his carriage is he is he does he have that yes. manner in real life or is he or is he much softer um no, he's he's pretty much what you get at at Berkshire. I mean, there's not a lot of pretense, I don't think, anymore. Once you get to that age and that wealth and that uh, level of understanding of how the world works, like he's just a straight even, shooter. Even uh, the way he walks, but is like that. I he actually almost ran into me at the uh, the Daily Journal annual meeting. It was it was long after it had ended, okay. and I was we we were sort of walking, and we were he has this huge walking staff. And he was, and he's a big guy. And once he gets going, he's going right. He's not stopping. And so we were about to cross paths, <laughs> and I actually had to skip a little bit to get out of his path so he didn't run into me. He was gonna. Just, I don't think he, he could. Wasn't yield. I think if he stopped, he he might not be able to get going again. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, you know, as a obviously a huge Munger fan, it was a very very surreal experience to to talk with him um but he was actually you know what was the craziest thing was um not that he read the book but that we actually after we talked about the book for a little while he started talking about uh some of my quarterly letters so he had somehow like gone and read some of my i mean they're available on it's not like he like hacked my website or anything they're available publicly but like he went and read through some of them i guess and like was because at the time I had been lamenting in 2019, like, gosh, I'm not finding a lot of investment opportunities. Um, you know, it seems like this is like really hard right now. And, and he actually said, you know, if he said, if, if you were finding, I'd be more worried about you if you were finding oh, a lot of opportunities right now. <laughs> so yeah, that, that actually, that blew my mind even more that he read the book was that he would actually go and. Wait, that's really cool. Letters. That's a big compliment. The accidents of the universe, I think, conspiring to. to make and didn't for he an mention something life. about a, You know, he thought it should become a movie. Yeah, that was the majority of like when we talked about the book was that he liked the idea of making it into a movie, and that he actually had like character notes about certain oh, people really? in the book. Uh, yeah, which was funny. It's like, yeah, come wait, on, wait, stay I in love your lane, this. So wait, he uh, thought he it reminded him of certain people, or was he like, oh, this character needs a little bit different arc? <laughs> yeah yeah i mean like some of both uh even he, he liked the idea of having um that there should be people in there who that who people would recognize as actual mm-hmm. like existing people and then just <laughs> skewering them like that was his idea like just I, he didn't I, I, he had a, a couple by name i'm not he gonna wanted, say he, wanted, he wanted he wanted elon musk to like get would, nailed that actually wasn't one of them, but like I think if uh, 
if I think if we had had that conversation a couple years after that, just based on what he said at Daily Journal uh, in the last few years, I think that that would have been maybe one of the things he said. But it was there were other people that he thought would be would be good to skewer in a kind of lampooning way via this in a, this in a funny way or in a we need to, we need to like this person stands for something just idiotic we need to take this down uh i think it's more like it would be a wink to the people who understood oh, okay. that this is ridiculous uh and that like you know we need to kind of hold them out here and in a way that you know reasonable people would understand that this you know we're we're making did you fun wind of up going over to his house Okay. No. Okay. Not, Not yet. yet. I, I would be very curious what the Munger residence <laughs> is like. I love that someone answered the phone, Munger residence. That's how we were raised to, to answer the phone growing up, and no one else did it. Yeah. I, I, uh, we don't have – well, we have a home phone, but no one ever calls it because it's, like, not a real number, basically. Why do you still have one? So, we don't have that even – For your alarm system or something? <sighs> It's no, but it's 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 like so cheap to include in your your bundle with the cable and the internet that having it as just like a junk number to use on you know BS things that you have to sign oh. up for is like worth the I don't know eleven dollars or whatever. Uh, so I'm curious, you know, you've you've written this book, you know, it's it's become. I, I still you, you have so many reviews on Amazon. I, I think that's so cool that you wrote this, you know, this novel about something that you know, in the global, in the global sense is, is very esoteric to the average person. And, and yet you've got all these reviews and incredibly, yeah. they're glowing reviews. You have something like a 4.7, uh, rating on Amazon, which is, which is tough. None of my, none of my books got that higher rating. I mean, that's really hard to, to sustain that, but people really seem to love it. What, what do you think, or do you think there are that many people out there who are just actually kind of agree with value investing and what it's all about? Or what do you think you tapped into? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I think that there's probably an element of um, <clears throat> terrific starting mm -hmm. source material. So I, you know, mind Buffett and Munger, everything they said, every, everything they wrote, um, you know, Sam Walton was actually kind of a big influence in the book. Ray Kroc, like Mr. X is an amalgamation of really like Singleton, Buffett, Munger, Ray Kroc, and, okay. and Sam Walton. Um, so, you know, throw all those guys into a mixer and, and, and hit the blender button. Um, but so like that's, a, that really helps to start with good source material. Um, the fact that it's a story and is like kind of goes down easier, um, short chapters, <laughs> like, like we talked about before we started recording, uh, I think helps a lot. Uh, that just makes the book feel like you're making a lot of progress as you're reading it. And like, that, it's that's very easy to read. For people. As I told you, I, I um, read it to refresh myself and I wound up reading a hundred pages, you know, about a week ago. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I, I tried to tap into, and and this was like something that I actually really struggle with was the I, I was serving two masters in a way like I wanted to teach cap allocation and have that like be a a touchstone for business people to go and learn about what their different options are and how should they think through and really like what I wanted to do was to give them the confidence to make their own decisions on what they thought was right as opposed to looking around like mm -hmm. well what's everyone else doing like you know should i be reinvesting in my own business or should it be dividends or should it be buybacks or uh you know should what how should i think about debt uh all these different things that are super important to running a business and that you don't really get taught them anywhere like at, at, even in business school the you know like the amount of time that was spent on actually cap allocation and how to think through it was incredibly small and buffett said before that like that's like the number one job of the ceo is is to do effective cap allocation so i felt like there was this kind of gaping hole where uh you know no one had given them the confidence and and i'd like to think that you know if i'm flattering myself that if the amount of fragility that i might have been able to remove from the system of capitalism by having independent thought that goes into 
the businesses that are run would be mm-hmm. really satisfying for me. Um, as opposed to everyone doing herd, you know, lemming type behavior, that creates a fragile system that, that can lead to big booms and busts where people get fired and people, uh, you know, train for skills that end up being, you know, irrelevant. Uh, and like, that's like a waste of human time and energy and effort. Uh, it's a tax on the environment when we build stuff that we didn't actually need. Uh, there's nothing that saves the environment more than like canceling a project that should yeah. never have been built to begin with. Uh, so all of these little things that I was hoping would like actually create a more even anti-fragile uh, capitalistic society. Like I was hopeful that maybe I could even just nudge that, that giant rock, even just, you know, a quarter of an inch. Um, and then the other side of it, my, the second master I was trying to serve was to give people an appreciation of the everyday miracles that capitalism provides for us. And, and I'm not like a hundred percent Pollyannish on like, there are definitely negative externalities that we have to deal with. There are, uh, there, there are issues with it, but it's it's. I think it's still the best system that we found so far of how to cooperate and decide. You know what projects get funded, uh, how how energy gets directed. How do we best mm-hmm. fight entropy? In, in to go back to what you were saying, um, I think capitalism is the best version of that so far. And so, if I could do like feeling this sort of uh, tide shifting away from it over the last ten years, especially especially for younger people. I targeted the book, especially for young people, because I was hopeful that there would be a little bit of a nudge for them back uh, towards, uh, you know, at least like, let's give it a fair shake and and recognize some of the good things that capitalism does for us. Like even just walking into a grocery store and being able to see the plenty that is there is like such a miracle compared to most of humanity's experience. Like you would have never seen that kind of variety and freshness and (laughs) I mean, it's 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 truly boggles the mind, and yet we like are totally blind to it because it's it's the water in the that the fish doesn't yeah, know. Yeah, I, is all I, I feel like that with a lot of the young people that you know, tech do- has dominated so much of what they know. They either don't like capitalism or what they know of it is is tech, and it's not even you know, it's not really real tech, right? That, that's actually you know, sort of hard assets and stuff like that. It's it tends to be these the creation of these monopolies that that exist o- online. But even that, it's just kind of this ugly, I don't know, it just feels like a a lot of that, some of those companies are wonderful, but a lot of that is kind of cheap and ugly, and it's just sort of getting some amazing valuation and and cashing out, and it's kind of this game. And and I, uh, but I feel feel like your book, on the other hand, it really reminded me, you know, my grandfather um, and his brother, I grew up in South Dakota, they both owned a bunch of small businesses, and you know, I my great uncle created a small bank there and my grandfather opened a farm equipment distributorship, which is a really good business. And, you know, he, that family, my dad worked in it. They were very nice people. They, they had their issues, but they really worked very hard and tried to do right by people. You know, they give all their employees personality tests and try to put people in things where they would fit. And they'd often move people Mm -hmm. and put them in totally different roles where no one else would have thought to put them there and, and good things would happen. You know, they really cared about it. And I guess reading your book, yeah, you know, I think Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger connect us with that, that kind of, I don't know, it's like Americana capitalism. That That's kind of an obnoxious term, but it, it does kind of capture it. But your book, I felt like, was like that, where, you know, Mr. X is saying, hey, here's why we do this. We, we don't make as much money on it, but people, it means so much to people, and, you know, and that, and that, you know, that, that's good business. Yeah. I, but I but I don't hear that yeah with the tech stuff today. It's kind of this, I don't know. To me, it's this kind of superficial, very very lofty, grandiose language. But it never touches on those quiet little things. Yeah, I think that there is, um, uh, and another part that I I teased out in the book was actually the sacrifice that this main character, Mr. X, you has to do to be the best business person that he can be. And it's like the sacrifice is actually like time and relationships with his family. And, you know, I think that that actually happens a lot more than we care to always observe where, you know, there's people are not as connected with their families because they, they felt like they could actually make a bigger impact for humanity by focusing on their business. And, you know, Buffett might be the prime example of that, where he was, I think, often 
a little checked out at home because he was thinking about his business always. And, you know, the sacrifices that he made to be a teacher and to, you know, like he could have done everything probably less publicly and actually would have been better for his family. But we're all so much better off because he did in public in the way that he did. Like that's a that was a pretty material sacrifice that he made for all of us. And, you know, like not to make it all messianic here, but, um, you, know, I, you know, I think that is actually should be probably be appreciated that there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into making everyday people's lives better uh, at, at the expense of, you know, personal relationships mm-hmm. for some of these people. Um, so, you know, I think I, it's my favorite that I get a lot of nice notes about the book. Uh, and, and a lot of them come from sometimes older people who have run businesses and see that, you know, that they felt like they made the same kind of sacrifice and that they also see some of the things that they want to, that like they wish that their kids, you know, would read this and, or they buy copies for their kids to read. Um, and then actually the ones that are kind of my favorite are my wife really liked this book. Like I finally got her to find like a book about business that she finally liked um, because there's a story behind it. And so like, it's satisfying that when you can, sort of get to to people who wouldn't have had exposure to these kinds of messages necessarily because they typically come packaged in a very dry container. Um, And hopefully, you know, there's like, it made a little bit of a difference. I want to ask one last question. Um, You know, your mid career, you know, you're you're on this, this journey, um, you know, where value investing is at the centerpiece of it. And it's, but, but I think for you, it's something that's professional and also personal. And so you're, you're midway, you know, what do you want at the end of all this? Mm, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> and a little bit terrifying to answer. You can cry, but... <laughs> you can cry if you want. It, it um, makes me, it makes me uh, 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 get verklempt a little. I'm not going to, I'm not going to cry. <laughs> I work out. Uh, <laughs> um, so no, I mean, actually, you know what I'm, and this is a little bit of recency bias talking, but I'm actually, uh, I'm super passionate about impacting decision making for people and helping them improve it. Um, and that's like one of the biggest threads that runs through the book is is actually helping people to make better decisions. I just think that we're at like I I believe that in the next uh, let's say twenty five years we will look back at the previous couple hundred years and say God we were in the decision making dark ages like we just followed our gut and we then used our neocortex to be the spokesperson that exp- that was just making up the reasoning of why this is what we wanted uh and what i where i'm where that is going i think is that i think software is actually going to help us to make mm-hmm. way better decisions and in fact i think it's going to help people to to recognize the things about themselves about themselves that that they are blind to right now it, it, actually in real time so Imagine, and I, I'm, I'm I'm developing a company right now that's working on this. So that's what I'm so I'm mm-hmm. mostly passionate about it. Um, and we're starting with helping investors make better decisions. But it it comes back to gathering up all of these inputs on the front end of your decision making process, and then helping you to understand how those connect with the back end of the results of the decision, and then closing that feedback loop so that you. That, that's how you can learn is when you get feedback loops closed and you see input leads to output and, and eliminating and that, that bias and that noise that exists in mm-hmm. between input and output is how humans are able to understand their environment better and actually like start to get to where you have intuition about something. Um, intuition does not grow without feedback loops that are closed. So I want to, through software, help close feedback loops for people. Uh, starting in the domain of investing, but I think there's actually applications all over the place, um, anywhere humans are making high leverage decisions. And like, if if in 20 years I have this company will be able to help people to do that, I think would be so super satisfying and like may, and and be an even bigger impact than anything that I would do managing money or writing a book or doing the podcasts that I do that are, you know, with, with Bill and Toby that are fun to do and entertaining. But this is like a, one of those, like, you know, big audacious projects that probably won't work, but if it does, I think it's like, could how have a huge impact. Decisions that are, you know, it's very interesting what you're saying about how the only way to develop your gut instinct is, is through short, shorter feedback loops or, or just the existence of a feedback loop at all. 
But what what do you do right. for a longer tail decision, right? Because so many of the biggest decisions in life, it, there there yeah. isn't there's an incomplete feedback loop or not one at all. How do you handle that? Yeah, I mean, some of them are almost intractable. I mean, um, it, whether it is a, such a long feedback loop that you you will never really uh, mm-hmm. you can't change behavior fast enough ever, be, or whether the sample size is too small ever. So, for instance, marriage might be a good example of that. Like, unless you're Elizabeth Taylor, like how many t- how are you going to get so many reps to ever have any intuition right. about a marriage right. and whether it's a good fit, right? Um, that that's relatively intractable, I think. Uh, but, but you know, in 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 the investment no, context, no, sorry, I was well, go ahead, Scott. Go ahead. Um, in the investment context, uh, you know, right now people are driving based on prices, effectively, of their securities. Like, what were your returns for this year? And that's you know, after a year or two, I- am I good at this or not? Right. And I think that is an incredibly dangerous and slow way to accumulate the data set of whether you yeah. have luck versus skill. So there are other ways that we can capture more data than, than that on the front end. And it really has to do with the the tenants in Phil Tetlock's book, Super Forecasting, which has making predictions about events in a probabilistic way so that you can see, are you properly calibrated as far as, you know, if you say revenue is going to grow at 10%, you know, and you're, there's a 70% probability of that happening. You can, uh, and it, that should happen seven out of 10 times that you make that, that, that class of observation. Uh, if, if it's different than that, then you aren't properly calibrated as to your, your confidence mm-hmm. versus your competence. So, uh, you know, you can look at a bunch of different business fundamentals and be capturing data points about those and making probabilistic predictions about them. And, you know, it's really easy to get that N of observations up higher than just purely returns, mm-hmm. which come once a year. Uh, so that's one way of shortening the feedback loop on this particular problem of, of, uh, <coughs> of you know, luck versus skill no, in the investment arena. You know, one of my favorite, actually probably my favorite part about super forecasters is the fact that it's that something that experts say cannot happen you know, happens, you know, 15% of the time. Yeah. Something something like that. That, (laughs) But I find that to be so true in my own life. It's, it's sort of like when when you're, it's interesting you're talking about calibrating because, you know, we interact a lot with the world through media and someone stating their opinion, some investment manager. And then separate from that is the world that we tangibly act in in front of us in our towns and places like that in there it is so hard to be intelligent in both you, you know i you know, i in my own life yeah. the, the impossible has happened all the time all the time things that i thought would never happen yeah. you know someone who i think is a son of a bitch and is a son of a bitch will actually do something nice and and it seems to make no sense but yeah but shit like that happens all the time but but it's funny you when it comes to that kind of macro you know, disembodied, abstract world that we get yeah. from our computer screens. It's so hard to be smart in that world. That, that's interesting, though, but w- that you're working on all this stuff. Well, and you know what we've discovered is that a big part of the uh, the trick is actually journaling as an interface with the brain. And so getting this this connection of dumping it out, actually, and then being able mm-hmm. to see what you wrote in the past – is is such a powerful mechanism like it's unbelievable to to just have that self-reflection built in and see what you wrote about something is it's insane what it shows you about yourself which i think at the end of the day like i think kahneman says that overconfidence is like the number one bias that he's most worried about and like it afflicts the most people and that the humility that comes from going and having to read your old journal entries about what you thought about something it, it like it sets you in your place in such a way that like I think you then are much less likely to make big catastrophic errors because you just recognize like I am so fallible and and my brain if I just only trust my brain to be the uh, the the record keeper of what happened and what I was thinking at the time your brain will play tricks on you and to protect your ego it, it will rewrite history for you so that you don't 
jeopardize your ego. And you you need to have your your ego jeopardized if you actually want to get better because that's where like the pain comes is what leads to the the truth, which leads to then uh, learning and actually getting better. So like we we're all walking around with our feedback loops open and ways to close them are, I think are just like they're they be, they're sort of like well duh like keep a journal but like the fact is that no one is actually really doing it and so if we make it easier for you to do it and provide you with a bunch of stuff on the back end that kind of gets you excited about what you're going to know about yourself because of this then I think that it's like enough of a it's it's that it provides that activation energy to keep that journaling habit going potentially that can really make to lead to big gains and um yeah, you, know, you said about like coloring your world and and how you interact with it. I think actually like your your biochemistry is is a huge huge component of how you're coloring the world and every new data point that comes in. So you know whether you are you had a terrible night's sleep last night or your whatever you ate isn't agreeing with you or like literal like you know glucose is low in your system and you know you're hangry like that there are these studies about judges and like, if you were on trial, you want a morning trial because you're much more likely to be acquitted and you're much more likely to get the book thrown at you after lunch. That's uh, crazy. It, and like, it, it all has to That's do with crazy. like what they ate for lunch. Uh, and so, but we're doing that all the time ourselves. And so uh, this, this software that we're building eventually is going to be capturing biometrics from your your smart your wearable whether it's you know your aura ring or your apple watch or whatever and and porting that in so that we have this data set about correlating your biochemistry and your and all those things that are happening to you that are sort of below your consciousness with the eventual outcomes and, and then prospectively being able to tell you like okay you're in a great spot to be making a decision today like all, all everything's lined up biochemically you got a great night's sleep we can tell like your heart rate variability is on point like you're you're ready to make a good decision today or conversely you know you're a wreck today like take today off don't make that big decision um, i think there's there's all these there's all this data that exists in the meta decision space about like what is going and driving that human cognition that we're blind to and we just need to bring that data out of the you know shine a little bit of light on it so that then it can start to impact and improve oh, the decision making process um, you know david hume the the scottish philosopher you know makes a distinction between the violent passions and the calm passions right the violent passions would be you know revenge System yeah, one, system the, two, basically. Yeah, <laughs> and the calm passion, you know, calm passion equivalent of retribution would be justice. But it sounds like you're basically trying to recalibrate people mm. in, in more in line with the calm passions and, and the in the things that are going to endure. Correct. the The original working name of this this company was System Two, and that has to do with Kahneman's, you know fast and slow thinking and system two is that slow, deliberate, uh, painful actually to execute thinking as opposed to the, the knee jerk gut, uh, you know, impulse that you, that hot feeling that you get, um, from an emotional standpoint, uh, that's like your mm -hmm. system one activation. So yes, that is the, that is the eventual goal is to activate more system two in the world, uh, and, and help, uh, improved his human decision making really like That's at the really end of the day well listen jake I, I thank you very much for coming on i really appreciate it and i'd love to have you on again sometime uh anytime scott i mean i think uh you know you and i have talked a lot over the over the years now and it's always fun so it's it's probably about time that we recorded some of them yeah we got to go to uh we got to get to one of these conferences uh, i don't know which one we go to we can't go to um what's the one we'd go to in new york with that weird guy, Big Larry. Uh, we can't. I can't go. Yeah, that, that's too far. That's in San Antonio that's too now. Far if, for me. if you want to go, it's, I, I, but, it's still happening. <laughs> we'll, we'll find something to go to. <laughs> we need to we'll get you back to L.A. That'll be a good one. We'll go hang yeah. out with. with I, I miss L.A. L.A. is a good place. Or we can go up to Canada to. Uh, yeah, yeah. Toronto Fairfax. for that Fairfax. That was fun. All right. Yeah, Great to see that. you, Jake. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. You too, Scott.